Good afternoon. I'm Shihoko Gerto I, with the Wilson Center's Asia program. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, for those of you who, are, um, who find yourselves logging into a Wilson Center event uh, for the first time, just a few words about the center itself. Uh, the Wilson Center was established in 1968 as an act of Congress as a living memorial to the 28th president of the United States. Its mission is to bridge the world of ideas with the world of policy and bring forward so-called actionable ideas. Today's discussion is particularly relevant to the center's mission. Um, we have a few days until the US elections and over the course of the last few months and indeed over the past year, um, we've had a lot of discussion about targeting values-based voters, identifying who those values-based voters are, trying to figure out what those values may be and where to connect with them. In the realm of foreign policy, we've had much discussion about uh, sharing common values between the United States and its allies and partners and you having a united front to establish and strengthen the existing liberal order. We understand implicitly what those values may be. But I, the mission today is to really have an in-depth discussion about what exactly we mean, we mean by cultural values um, and what it means in the context of globalization and competitiveness. And to that extent, to, to that end, I'm really excited to be able to introduce a newly published book. It is called Cultural Values in Political Economy, published by Stanford University Press. And I'm very excited to be able to introduce some of the contributors uh, to the book, um, as well as a formidable discussant to, to really take a deep dive into some of the content and what makes this particular book so relevant to the discussions um, in the election process in the United States and the change in the regional order, especially in Asia. Um, we will be joined by a number of speakers, uh, including JP Singh, who is Professor of International Commerce and Policy at George Mason University. Kristen Hopewell, Associate Professor at the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at the University of British Columbia. Miles Collar, a former Wilson Center Fellow and Distinguished Professor at the School of International Service at American University. Irene Wu, also a former Wilson Center Fellow and an adjunct professor of Communications, Culture and Technology uh, program at Georgetown University. And Christina Davis, professor at the Department of Government and director of the program on US-Japan relations at Harvard University. Uh, I should also add that you may email us questions to any of the speakers at any time uh, to asia at wilsoncenter.org. Again, that's asia at wilsoncenter.org, or you can tweet your questions to Asia Program. So with that, uh, let me start by asking JP, uh, you are the editor of the book. And uh, perhaps you can start us off by talking about why you came to write this, uh, put together this book. And also, um, given your focus on trade, uh, perhaps discuss uh, why you decided to, uh, how, how this um, issue of culture has an impact on trade relations. Thank you very much, Shehoko, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I want to thank the Wilson Center and especially Shehoko Goto for putting this uh, webinar together. And apart from uh, my uh, contributors here, uh, my co-contributors here, I also want to really thank uh, Professor Christina Davis uh, for, for reading our book and commenting. Professor Davis and uh, 
with the Carol Greenhouse have also put together a volume which also touches on cultural matters, uh, landscapes of law practicing sovereignty in the transnational terrain. So, so we couldn't ask for a better respondent. That is to say, go easy on us later. <laughs> but for now, I'll turn to the question, uh, Shehoko, that you have asked us. You know, we are seeing a breakdown of multilateral institutions and starting in 2016, I was when I was at the University of Edinburgh, uh, we were hit with these uh, uh, shocks in some ways of what happened with uh, the Brexit vote, for example, uh, where we didn't expect it to go a particular way. And then also a number of electoral results prior to 2016 and then 2016 onwards, which have produced for us a lot of populism and, and authoritarian anxieties and these pervasive cultural anxieties about economic conditions and what they might mean for the world. At the same time, as we see, uh, multilateral institutions are not what they were 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So we decided to convene a conference looking at uh, not what people's interests would be, but what informs those interests? And that's what brought us to the notion of culture or a deeper understanding of where do our interests and preferences than all of us as scholars are concerned about, whether it's in political economy or it's in sociology or other terrains, that uh, perhaps looking at culture might instruct us a, a, a bit on that. So it was what, what our panel here is going to talk about, although the book is much broader, is how do those cultural values relate to multilateralism and multilateral institutions. And an exploration of those values uh, can tell us something about where we're headed next. So very quickly, what I'm going to do is speak to what are cultural values, uh, what went perhaps wrong or right with multilateral institutions, and where do we go from here? So first of all, what are values? Values, as the term implies, are weights, importance, or rank given to things. Uh, you know, when we started this venture, I was in Edinburgh and Scottish Enlightenment philosophers could not speak of people's interests without talking about moral sentiments, the broader social context within which people's interests were, were buried. So uh, that's in a way speaking to the weight that moral sentiments or culture would attach uh, to, to values. And now, obviously, when we speak of cultural values, we're talking about these weights uh, or values that are shared among groups. So co collectively, cultural values are repertoires that make or that allow people to make sense of their world. Arjuna Padre, the anthropologist, wrote a foreword for a work where he says, culture is a scheme of action. It's a map of possibilities. And that's kind of the way that we are speaking of, of cultural values. Um, as, as you said yourself, uh, Shioko, uh, you know, we, we are now beginning to question the values behind the multilateral order that came into being in the post-war era. And I'll, I'll, I'll get to that very quick, but first three very quick um, uh, 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 points that I want to make. That cultural values, when we speak of them in any sense, and collectively, we're speaking of plural cultural values. So there's not one cultural value that we can boil down as here is a national value, or here is a value with which we can identify a particular religion, which is probably why that we stay away from debates about identity, because oftentimes in politics, debates about identity are prefacing one particular type of value. Second, cultural values evolve through time. They're syncretic. And third, cultural values can be contradictory. Um, and and, and Swidler, the sociologist says, um, the cultural values are diverse, often conflicting symbols, rituals, stories, and guides. So when we speak of the cultural values that created the multilateral order, uh, an exhumation would mean that we speak to the cultural values like exchange, reciprocity, law, uh, et cetera, which inform that order. But perhaps we can also take account of uh, some other cultural values that may not be that, that positive. And in my own chapter, in many ways, I have, I've, I've done that. But before I go into um, the empirical example that I bring up in my chapter, I do want to say that uh, where I want to get to with this is that when we speak of a current moment where we're speaking of uh, the frustration 
are the cultural anxieties of those who have been excluded and the uh, anger that we often hear about uh, from people about who they've been left behind, etc. What I want to trace in, in, in the next few minutes is that they've always been left behind through this multilateral order. So what we're paying attention to right now, they're left behind perhaps in the United States or in Britain. Uh, but let's also speak of the people who were always left behind and then we can try to uh, move forward with this. The story that I uh, tell in my chapter, and I'm going to uh, bring up my slides here, is a story of paternalistic values which carried over from the um, uh, colonial era. As uh, in the post-colonial world, as developing countries are coming onto the world stage, um, you know, what they perhaps would look forward to is that they can grow their industry, that they can export their agricultural crops, uh, that they can diversify. Instead, what I uh, show in my book based on a previous book that I had written called Sweet Talk is that the developing world was pretty much shut out of the global trading order in this particular case. So I wanted to see if the US actually acted paternalistically towards the developing world. And if there was a paternalistic value, not just in the United States, but also in the developed worlds, because that's what the developing world has been argued that they've been shut out and that, that the global North acts quite paternalistically towards them. And that if I could find a correlation between those values and the way that they were excluded through the order, I won't go through all the evidence, but this slide, the next one here, uh, what it did was uh, it, uh, through a FOIA request, I got all the USTR press releases from 1982 to 1995, corresponding roughly with the beginnings of a trade run, which later would be called the Uruguay round of trade talks, which went on from 1986 to 1994. And out of 1,462 press releases that I received, 710 contained paternalistic statements. These are pretty moralizing statements towards the developing world of which over 93% of them were towards what is non-OECD countries, but most of them are global South countries. So when we make paternalistic statements in our press releases from the USTR, the target is the developing world. Another example of paternalism would be foreign aid, which is ostensibly to help the developing world. And in those paternalistic statements, we're saying, here, take the foreign aid, for example, and export your commodities to the world. What I actually found was in this, this graph is a perfect hyperbola uh, in some ways, that when the developed world gives development assistance, uh, countries do not receive agricultural concessions. Okay. So in a way, foreign aid is, uh, I, as I tried to show in, in my writing, is somewhat of a manipulative tool. Okay. So uh, uh, one example that I can give over here is that of Philippines uh, sugar industry. Um, in the 1940s, the sugar industry in the United States uh, really argued for Philippines independence. And, and their briefs in Congress about uh, how this was a question about human rights and, and the, the sugar barons in the United States said they wanted Philippines independence. In hindsight, as soon as the Philippines was granted independence, we slapped tariffs on them because, uh, and the price of sugar was raised in the United States. Now sugar has a long colonial history. Uh, slavery is connected with sugar. So what, I, what I'm pointing to here is that what appears as tariffs, et cetera, have a historical cultural stickiness to them. And the example that I've taken is that of a particular type of cultural stickiness. One could take the example of cotton in the United States and the kind of current politics about cotton, and you could go there as well. Or you could take examples of high-tech industries, a lot of the racism directed against India in, in the 21st century as Indian services grew uh, uh, is an example of how paternalism continues um, even when the industries are not uh, agricultural per se. So what I've given you here is uh, a story of multilateralism, which doesn't deny that there's exchange and reciprocity or international, but just to ward us against just seeing one set of left behinds. Now, where do we go from here? And this is the slide that I wanted to put up, which speaks to my earlier three points about uh, culture. Uh, culture obviously has a functional role to play, which we might call instrumental power. So cultural values allow for interactions and then interest, and then we get outcomes. But in a dynamic setting, new cultures come about by interacting with each other. 
And what we have with us, I would argue, is a new culture. And, and Miles Kaler, who's going to speak after me, will do a far better job of this, that we also have with us uh, globally shared cultural values, which exist along with uh, other types of, of values. And, uh, and so, um, with these globally shared cultural values, what we have is a scenario over here, which I would argue allows for multilateralism to be situated at a, 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 at a far deeper level than some of the framers of the multilateral order in the post-war eras. We can revisit those figures, Cordell Hurl, uh, Roosevelt, or the person under whose name we are convening today, and we find that they were the elite. But right now, when we speak of globally shared cultural values, we're speaking of something quite different. I've already given you the example of trade. Let me take an example from culture about globally shared cultural values. In David Trosby's chapter in a volume, he speaks to the Convention for International Cultural Heritage. Uh, one of the chief movers for the, in, uh, for, the, for the notion of intangible cultural heritage was Japan, but also Sub-Saharan Africa. Koichiro Matsura at that time was the director general of UNESCO, but even before he took over the DG ship, uh, UNESCO had started to move towards having a convention on intangible cultural heritage, which would be very different from the kind of cultural heritage convention that we know of where Taj Mahal is included or the pyramids are included. Uh, the notion came from the fact that oftentimes cultural heritage is a very European, uh, North American sort of a concept, but there are things which are very intangible. For example, this 2000 year old Shinto shrine in Japan, where the wood must be replaced every 20 years. So what needs to be guarded are the processes of replenishment and not just this, this sort of uh, uh, monumental type of cultural heritage. The second thing that developed as a result of the intangible cultural heritage convention was that communities would forward these lists and not just uh, uh, the sort of the Ministry of International Culture in Paris known as, known as UNESCO. And so what we see in international cultural heritage is a grassroots movement which trickles its way up to the top. And I think it's a really nice example of how to frame new conventions uh, and a convention is an international legal document, and ones which, which are culturally diverse and, and also speak to sort of the grassroots. And we can see similar types of movements in, in development. We can begin to, especially the notions of participatory development, and we can begin to see them in, in other uh, arenas as well. So moving forward, I would say we need to first look and locate these new cultural values, which obviously sit astride uh, no, notions of populism, authoritarianism, the left behind, etc. But then we need to be also inclusive about who has gotten left behind. We need to strengthen multilateral coalitions and, and networks and make sure that these rules are inclusionary. Well, one might say, well, that's a really tall order. I would say historically, we've had tall orders before. Tall orders where you know uh, towns were pitted against the countryside, tall orders where nation states were pitted against uh, empires. Uh, or the city states. Uh, and, and those were huge cultural battles. And now we have a cultural battle where the multilateral order that we had in the world uh, from the mouths of a few elite in some ways has a place that could be more embedded in grassroots type of cultural values. And obviously it's gonna face opposition. It's too early to tell where we would go, but it's not unlike other cultural battles that we faced. And I would say looking at cultural values would be the place to start for it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, JP, for that very insightful analysis. Um, before I turn to Miles, um, let me remind the audience that we are accepting questions. Again, the email address is asia at wilsoncenter.org, or you can tweet us at uh, Asia Program. Uh, Miles, um, I know you've written a chapter entitled Cosmopolitans and Parochials, Economy, Culture, and Political Conflict. And one of the first things you do is define what parochialism, um, parochials is, and you describe them as defensive ethno-nationalists. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, your uh, discussion about uh, your chapter. Thanks. 
Thank you, Shahoko. Uh, let me share my screen. My chapter, as Shihoko uh, has just mentioned, centers on the political challengers to economic openness and the multilateral order that has sustained it. Uh, these movements have been very prominent in the US and Europe in recent years. Um, Brexit, obviously, 2016, the election of Donald Trump and his administration in the last four years, and the progress of movements in Europe, such as the Alternative for Germany, AFD, or the Rassemblement National in France. And the question that has arisen, and there's been a large amount of scholarship on this, is, is economics or culture? What I do in my chapter very briefly is to argue that political movements that react against features of international economic integration um, um, are often based on perceptions of local economic decline and the parochial cultures that experience that decline. It produces cultures that are that that um, it cultures that are then linked to trade or immigration by national parties and le leaders. It's an argument from national uh, from economic geography, and it argues that um, much opposition to globalization, in fact, has local roots. There are two sets of attitudes shaped by local culture, cosmopolitans and parochials. And I prefer parochials to um, parochials to nationalists, though I define parochials in part through their defensive ethno-nationalism, as Shihoko has mentioned. Parochials are based in the places that have been left behind, and they've received the most attention. But it's important to note also that there is a rise of movements and parties based on internationalism and support for the multilateral, multilateral order. And they are centered in vibrant urban hubs, global cities closely linked to the global economy, mobilized by issues such as climate change and cultural diversity. And this is particularly the case, for example, with the green parties in Europe. And the future of the conflict between these two politically mobilized orientations toward the international order is particularly important in considering the world that export dependent economies of Asia will face in the coming year in coming years, especially in the uncertain economic environment after the pandemic. Will these political movements continue to ascend? And I argue that these are a new political divide. Once again, perceptions of local economic conditions produce cultural outcomes that have political consequences and attitudes toward globalization have local roots. Um, now, the future of the conflict is in doubt, obviously, and particularly in doubt in the United States, given that we have a large election, uh, an important national election coming out next week, in which very much the cleavage is between parochials and cosmopolitans, and it's been defined in that way by both sides. There's turmoil surrounding Brexit in the UK, which is still not resolved after four years uh, past the referendum. Current surveys indicate there's a higher level of Brexit regret in the UK than ever before. Um, in other parts of Europe, there's a fragmentation of the AFD, the far right party in Germany. The Austrian far right Freedom Party saw a collapse in its support a few weeks ago in elections in, in Austria. Italy's league also has suffered setbacks in regional elections in the fall. And we've seen a rise of green parties, the cosmopolitan alternative as well. Nevertheless, the local conditions that I have pointed to as producing these movements, whether in Eastern Germany, the north of England or the declining manufacturing centers of the US Midwest will persist and they will require new policy responses to underpin an international economy that is going to remain highly integrated. And we may want to discuss this in the Q&A, but my view is that the death of globalization has been vastly exaggerated. And in fact, even the decoupling between the US and China has been exaggerated. So we're still being, we will still need to deal with an integrated global economy. We will still want multilateral solutions. And the question is, will these movements persist uh, and continue to undermine the multilateral order as we have known it since uh, the post-war years in the post-war decades. Now, the second uh, set of remarks I would like to make is what policy responses could we make to deal with the left behind sectors, the left behind communities that generate and produce parochial politics and undermine support for multilateralism. On the cultural front, there's a real need to construct a new cosmopolitan narrative, less elitist, more accepting of local loyalties and anxieties that often generate support for parochial movements without accepting the xenophobia that is often part of the parochial counter narrative. And it's essential for rebuilding the broader support for policies of openness that existed in the past. Even more important now in thinking ahead to the post pandemic world 
this construction of a new narrative becomes ex extremely important when competing narratives and lessons learned will become uh, generated by the pandemic experience and the experience of global cooperation or lack of cooperation during the pandemic. On the policy front, we also need to diffuse issues that will drive the hostility that drive the hostility toward multilateralism and parochial politics, especially immigration. And there are industrialized countries such as Canada that while hardly perfect, have built a wide national consensus on relatively high levels of immigration. And finally, as a policy response, we need to address the plight of the places, what have been called the places that don't matter in Europe and in the United States. Past, pla past place-based policies directed to helping these uh, areas, whether in US Appalachia or the south of Italy, have not been successful. And we need place sensitive programs that differentiate among those left behind. This is a work in progress, a work that is only beginning and one that is going to be essential if the left behind areas that generate parochial politics are going to feel themselves part of a national and international community once again. Finally, what of Asia? itself, which at the moment appears particularly favored, at least Northeast Asia, in both its timely and relatively successful responses to the pandemic and a revival of economic growth based on exports. Is there a similar split between parochials and cosmopolitans likely in Asia? Why haven't we seen such a split? Or it seems to me we have not seen such a split. And here I certainly bow to the expertise of Professor Davis, our discussant, and others in the audience on this point. But here are some hunches. I would put them at no stronger than hunches on my part. First. I would point out that nationalism is pervasive in Asia, particularly in Northeast Asia, and it's not limited to opposition or right-wing movements. Witness the periodic eruption of nationalist conflict over issues of history in recent years between South Korea governed by the left and Japan governed by the right. And support for multilateralism at the regional level is uneven. Long-running negotiations in Northeast Asia for a free trade agreement, which has not materialized, very slow process on RCEP, another uh, pan-Asian trade agreement. A second point would be, and a second explanation might be, simply lower levels of immigration. Immigration is the issue that has driven much of the surge of support for right-wing parochial politics in Europe and the United States. Until recently, uh, there were very low levels of immigration in Northeast Asia, but the rich countries of Asia, Japan, South Korea, and in Southeast Asia, Singapore, are facing a demographic crisis. Japan has recently instituted by past standards a substantial increase in immigration but immigrants are still less than 3% of the population. Compare that to 14% in the United States. South Korea has followed a similar path of very gradual open. Singapore is a very interesting counterexample because historically, at least in this century, Singapore has taken a much more welcoming and cosmopolitan stance toward immigration, but often immigrants were better educated than the native born population. And they now make up 40% of the Singaporean population. And there has been in Singapore a political backlash somewhat similar to what we have seen in parts of Europe and the United States. Finally, there's more willingness to protect economic sectors in decline, perhaps one could say in Asia, particularly agriculture, something that Professor Davis is certainly expert on, um, and also declining industries, as well as encouragement by those declining industries to move abroad in order to survive. There have been relatively low levels of unemployment in Northeast Asia, permitting movement from declining sectors and regions to growing sectors. And perhaps most important, in these economies, much like the smaller European economies, there's a great awareness of dependence on the international economy and international trade, similar to the smaller European countries where a reaction against trade, at least, though not always immigration, has generally been absent during this period of conflict between cosmopolitans and parochials. So depending on the political outcomes in the United States and Europe in the next few years, Asia, together with smaller trade dependent industrialized economies, may become an island of support for multilateralism in an uncertain global economy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miles. Um, I'm going to turn to Kristen now. Um, she's contributed a chapter entitled Ideology, um, Economic Interests, and American Exceptionalism, the Case of Export Credit, where she focuses really on the Tea Party and the Export-Import Bank. Um, and it, one of the striking um, arguments she makes is that uh, the Tea Party has really focused on restrict, essentially uh, taken on this issue of export credit um, and focused on uh, uh, restricting government intervention based on a false narrative of US exceptionism. That is to say that the argument that 
there is a natural inherent superiority of the United States, um, especially in the technology industries is based on false assumptions. So I'm looking forward very much, Kristen, to, to your analysis um, of the situation. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to focus on the issue of multilateralism in uh, international trade specifically. And um, as Shihoko said, my chapter in the, the volume looks at um, cultural values in the form specifically of ideology. Um, and I focus on how um, a powerful ideology led the US to take steps that were actually against its own economic interests. So the case that I look at in the chapter is the Tea Party campaign against the US Export Import Bank. Uh, which is a government agency that provides financing to support U.S. exports. And uh, the Exim Bank is a, an important economic policy tool. Uh, it fills gaps in the availability of private financing. It strengthens the competitiveness of U.S. exports, and it also makes money for the U.S. government. But driven by um, an extremist free market ideology, uh, the Tea Party objected to the activities of the bank, uh, arguing that it constituted corporate welfare. Uh, and it waged a successful campaign that ultimately uh, forced the Exim Bank to effectively shut down and cease operations for almost four years. And that left the US as essentially the only major economy in the world without a functioning export import bank. So uh, driven by this uh, market fundamentalist ideology of the Tea Party, the US took steps that um, actually harmed its own economic interests. So I think we're seeing something similar today under President Trump, where um, we've seen the rise of this uh, America first virulently nationalist ideology, which similarly has led the US to take actions that have actually um, ultimately undermined its own economic and strategic interests. So over the past several years, we've seen the US uh, arbitrarily impose tariffs on all of the US's major trading partners. Um, we've seen it violate the rules of the WTO blatantly and repeatedly. And we've also seen it jeopardize the, the WTO's dispute settlement mechanism by blocking appointments to the appellate body. So the, this collection of actions has really thrown the rules-based multilateral trading system into crisis. Uh, the US has, has turned away from the multilateral institutions uh, in trade that it, it built and that it led for the past 70 years. And that really served as an important channel to consolidate and project its power globally. And it's also abandoned the, what I would argue is the core principle of multilateralism, um, the notion that relations among states should be based on the rule of law rather than the raw use of power. And instead, what we've seen is the US turn towards aggressive unilateralism, towards coercion and bullying, directed not just at those countries that the US has identified as strategic competitors or threats, but also against its closest allies, uh, Europe, Japan, Canada, Korea, Australia, and others. And the irony, I think, is that these actions aren't actually strengthening the US, but they're doing just the opposite, um, accelerating the US's relative economic decline, doing immense damage to US alliances and its international standing, and also diminishing American power and influence on the international stage. So with this, the WTO under assault from the Trump administration, China has sought to position itself as a, a defender of free trade and the liberal trading order. Uh, we saw this most prominently uh, in President Xi Jinping's headline grabbing speech in 2017 at the World Economic Forum at Davos, where he very much sought to position China in this way. And since then, there's been considerable speculation about whether China would step up and assume a more significant leadership role in the multilateral trading system and really serve as a bulwark for the system. But it's not just enough to pay lip service to multilateralism, that also needs to be backed by action. And we haven't really seen any meaningful leadership from China over the past four years at the WTO. Um, states have been uh, actively engaged in a range of different types of efforts to save the WTO, but China has really been more of a follower rather than a leader in these endeavors. Uh, the most prominent one has been uh, an initiative spearheaded by the EU to create an interim appeals mechanism to um, replace the, the defunct appellate body until there's a, a resolution to the appellate body crisis. And this has been a critical initiative to try to um, maintain the dispute settlement mechanism within the WTO, a two-tier system of resolving disputes where countries have the ability to appeal trade disputes. Um, and this, this is an important initiative. It's gained widespread support for many states around the world. And China is a participant in this initiative, but it's really um, a follower rather than a leader following in the lead of the EU who's really been the, the key force behind this. 
So I think if, if China is truly interested in preserving the rules-based multilateral trading system, one key area where it could show leadership is in securing a meaningful, ambitious WTO agreement on global fishery subsidies. And this is essentially the sole active area of multilateral negotiations at the WTO right now. And achieving a successful agreement is really seen as essential to demonstrating the continued relevance of the institution and its system of global trade rules. The UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals identified the need for a WTO agreement to eliminate harmful fisheries subsidies as an urgent international priority and set a deadline for states to try to do this by the end of this year. So the goal is to try to achieve a, a triple win, uh, an outcome that's positive, not just for trade, but also for development and for the environment. We know that subsidies have played a major role in creating a global fisheries crisis. Um, overfishing fueled by subsidies is leading to the rapid depletion of global fish stocks. And this has been particularly harmful uh, for many developing countries who rely heavily on fisheries for exports, incomes, and food security. But in the absence of strong leadership, the negotiations have become stalled. There's been relatively little progress. But this is an area where China could potentially play a decisive role. China dominates the global fishing industry. Um, it has by far the world's largest industrial fishing fleet. China alone accounts for about 42% of total global fishing activity. So it's uh, you know, a massive player in the global fishing industry. And it's also the world's biggest subsidizer of fisheries, um, providing vastly greater uh, volumes of harmful subsidies than any other country. So if China were to step up and assume a leadership role by signaling a willingness to significantly reduce its subsidies, that could potentially be a game changer in the negotiations. But instead, what we've seen is that China seems to be seeking to claim developing country status in order to secure special and differential treatment to exempt its subsidies from disciplines. So I would argue that a true commitment to a rules-based multilateral trading system means not only enjoying the benefits of trade, but also being willing to shoulder the responsibilities of maintaining that system and ensuring that it brings benefits to all. And this is not something we've seen yet from China at the WTO, despite its professed commitment to multilateralism that hasn't actually been matched in deed or in action by China within the WTO. So as I said, these efforts to secure a fisheries deal are really um, a key test right now of the future of the WTO, uh, its ability to continue to function as a forum for negotiating multilateral trade rules. And I think this is a pr prime opportunity for the US to renew its commitment to multilateralism and to global institutions. Uh, fisheries is an area, the fisheries negotiations is an area where the US has traditionally been a key leader. Uh, it was the country that originally put fisheries uh, on the agenda at the WTO. And for many years, it was the key actor pushing for disciplines in this area. Um, that was until recent years when it, it turned away from the WTO. So if the, the US were to step up and to work with other states and show global leadership in a push to secure a successful agreement, I think within the trading system, this would be one of the most effective ways for the US to demonstrate a renewed commitment to multilateralism, to international cooperation and the rule of law, and also to defending the interests and standing in solidarity with, with weaker countries, defending their interests. And, uh, to date, the US approach to China has been arguably purely self-interested. It's been focused on the impact of China's subsidies and other trade practices on US economic interests. Um, and for that reason, it's focused primarily on China's industrial subsidies. But China's subsidies in other areas like fisheries and on agriculture are also having harmful effects for developing countries around the world. So I think this is an opportunity for the US to potentially work with other countries to try to combat harmful subsidies and to show that it's not just putting America first, but actually committed to um, helping to build a multilateral trading system that works for all. And I think this, this could be part of um, an effort by the US to be both smarter and more strategic in its approach to multilateralism. I think the US needs to be clearer about what its specific objectives are and how best to achieve them. I think one of the strongest uh, cases for the US to reinvest in multilater multilateralism and alliance building is the fact that China's GDP, the size of its economy, uh, is highly likely to surpass that of the US within the next decade or so. And in fact, it's already surpassed the US at PPP purchasing power parity rates. So if China is the US's principal concern, uh, a go it alone simply doesn't make sense as a strategy. With its relative economic power diminishing, the US needs allies now more than ever. And many other countries share US concerns, uh, particularly about China's human rights abuses, its rising authoritarianism, its increasingly aggressive stance within the region and beyond. 
So I would argue that it's, it's by forming alliances with like-minded states who share these sorts of values uh, that the US would be able to strengthen its influence and gain the critical mass that's necessary for it to effectively shape global order and advance its objectives. So I'll wrap up there, thank you. Thanks so much, Kristen. And that's a really great segue into Irene's um, discussion. She, of course, Irene, you focus on soft power, mm -hmm. which is perhaps the most important of them all in defining cultural values, but at the same time, it's also difficult to define, uh, but it, it plays a tremendous role in defining US-China friction as well. So take it away. Thank you very much. What an interesting set of presentations. Um, thank you so much for including me on this panel, um, for Shahoka for organizing it, and I really look forward to uh, Professor Davis's uh, comments. Um, so um, in addition to teaching at Georgetown, I also work at the US Federal Communications Commission, and I also must mention at this time that my uh, presentation is my own personal views and my own work outside the government, and this presentation doesn't reflect the views of the FCC, its uh, members, or its staff. Um, it was great to be part of this group of authors to contribute to JP's book on cultural values and political economy. My particular chapter focuses on international higher education. And I use that to create a picture of country soft power relationships. Um, today, I'm gonna focus on, um, on using the soft power rubric that I've created to compare US and China's influence in ASEAN countries. 10 uh, countries in Southeast Asia and higher education is certainly an important part of that. And it also, so that also connects uh, to this book. So soft power is really usually considered a country's ability to persuade other countries to its point of view uh, in a collaborative, non-coercive uh, way. And what motivated me to start doing this research to try to measure soft power in the international system is that other kinds of hard power, military power, economic power, we do have quantitative measures. But this soft power, which we all know is so important and influential in the international system, remains in the social science research really quite um, less well-defined and without a consensus or surrounding what possibly could be done to measure it quantitatively. So even though it seems like a moonshot to try to measure cultural values, I thought I would give it a try. And so I drew on my experience as a communication scholar to think of soft power from the perspective of the audience, not the producer. Um, that's what we do with television, right? So I'm trying to think of soft power from the perspective of people who are supposedly influenced by it, not from the perspective of governments who are trying to exert it over other countries. So if we accept this assumption and think of soft power as when foreigners think of us as we, rather than as they, and we think of soft power, countries having soft power relationships with each other rather than over each other, then that opens the possibility of connecting this issue in international relations with other parts of political science. So for example, if we go back to the scholarship of Karl Deutsch in the 1960s and 1970s, where you study national and social integration through looking at um, quantitative measures of communications and transportation, we can build on his work from there. Um, if we uh, think of the, the substantial work that is done in political science on social capital and what it takes for communities to um, uh, act together, the idea of, of social capital and collective action, we can build, uh, draw on that and build on that. And third, I think the other literature that's been very informative for me is Ellen Ostrom's work on trust and how communities, individuals and communities can learn to trust each other, that trust is not just a matter of belief and faith, but through reciprocal action and experience, people can decide rationally to trust each other to work together. So those are the literatures that I draw on. Concretely, um, I've built this soft power rubric and I'm gonna share that screen now. Um, thinking about what kinds of actions uh, do people take when they think um, they when they have an interest in another country, and you can I've got three slides in my presentation, and the first slide here you see the soft power rubric, and the second slide is the data that I'm going to share on U.S. and China's uh, influence in Southeast Asia, and the third is the citations for the data. 
So if you're interested in that, you can take a look at that. But let me discuss now the soft power rubric. Um, the four actions that I include in this rubric are if I'm interested in a foreign country, an easy thing I could do would be to just watch a movie from that country. Um, something that I could do as a huge investment would be to immigrate with my family to that other to that foreign country. And two intermediate actions would be to visit for short term or third to study abroad. There's data on how many students go abroad to foreign universities to enroll for a degree. So that's a, a very interesting indicator as well. Um, with the soft power rubric, uh, much like measures of the gross domestic product, um, I really try to reduce this idea of soft power to a single type observable uh, behavior. So with GDP, GDP is measuring productivity of the economy. It doesn't capture all kinds of economic activity, just production, and for that matter, just production that's got a dollar value attached to it and therefore can be counted. The result is an approach that allows uh, national productivity to be compared over time and also for the production of one country to com be compared with another. And that is what I'm trying to achieve here with the soft power rubric. It's not really possible to capture all influence, but if we pick an indicator that's countable and observable and can be compared across um, all these different countries, that might, might turn out to be useful. So this is what um, uh, I have here on Southeast Asia. Let me see if I can make this bigger. There we go. So um, this is a comparison of uh, data on people in Southeast Asia and the 10 ASEAN countries. When they choose to immigrate abroad or to study abroad or to visit foreign countries, where do they go? And these are all the top countries that are destinations for Southeast Asians when they go abroad. And it highlighted in yellow are the US and China. So you can see their relative stand status changing um, from the perspective of Southeast Asians between 2000 and 2019. So let's start with the first graph going abroad, uh, going across. And here we have uh, where do people from ASEAN, where do they immigrate? Um, definitely the US is the leader um, by far. Um, if we look here at the third row, where do ASEAN people go when they visit abroad? Definitely China is number one. And then in between here, we have where do uh, young people from ASEAN go to study? Um, you can see that the US is a major destination as is China. And uh, that uh, China's um, uh, popularity as a destination has increased tremendously between 2000 and 2017. So to look at this in detail, if we go back to immigration, um, the US in 2000 um, is the uh, home of 3 million immigrants from uh, Southeast Asian, these Southeast Asian countries. And in 2019, it was the host for 4.5 million of these immigrants, 2 million from the Philippines, and 1.4 million from Vietnam. We can also see that China does make it onto this chart. Um, in 2000, China is ranked 13th, and in 2019, it's ranked 17th. All right, if we go to travel here, we can see this is where China is really the leader, and you can see the social connections between China and the ASEAN countries. Um, uh, in 2000, China was the top destination, hosting 1.8 million travelers. By the time we get to 2018, China is hosting 25 million visitors. About 50% of those visitors are between China and Myanmar. So that's yet another story about the opening of that border. Um, the US is also a major destination when uh, people from ASEAN go abroad. Um, but at a much lower level than China. Um, in 2000, 550,000 visitors from ASEAN to the US. And then in 2018, the US drops from sixth to ninth, um, hosting 920,000 uh, visitors. So the number of visitors goes up, but Ch a US status uh, ranking goes down. Here we are with, um, in, the, in the center row, 
um, the data on education. And this is data on um, uh, students who enroll in foreign universities for a degree. So it's quite, quite specific and quite a major commitment on the part of students. And the US is really the um, leading destination in 2000. Um, it's uh, uh, China uh, uh, in 2000 um, hosts about 1300 students. It certainly um, rises to fifth place in 2016 to 24,000 students. Um, the country from uh, Southeast Asia that's sending the largest number of students to Chinese universities is uh, Thailand sending about 10,000 students in 2016. Um, for the US, um, th uh, in 2000, the US hosted 39,000 students and was the top destination. Um, in 2017, it hosted 56,000 students, uh, but it is uh, ranked second, as you can see the popularity of Australia um, has really grown in this period. So just a brief glance at this data, um, just a point of departure uh, for understanding the relationship, the people-to-people -people relationship between US and China and uh, people in the ASEAN region. Um, the US really leads uh, China in terms of committed long-term connection um, as the immigration data shows. However, a lot of people in ASEAN go to China as visitors, and this has been true now for several decades. With China's growing attraction as a destination for higher education, that means a new generation of ASEAN leaders will have more intimate knowledge of, uh, uh, of China's culture and society than the previous, uh, previous generation. So um, my book chapter, uh, Applying the Soft Power Rubric, How Study Abroad um, Data Reveals International Cultural Relations, essentially looks at uh, where a country sends uh, its students to study as a map of that country's social network of relationships. You know, uh, the country, the foreign countries that uh, people hold in high esteem, that's where they send their young people to study. And there are two cases that I look at. One is uh, where students from Africa go abroad. And interestingly, one of the major destinations for students from Sub-Saharan Africa is Malaysia. So that is an evolving um, and growing regional educational hub. And the second case that I look at examines the degree to which families in former colonies still send their young people to study in the former colonial power. And that's really a story about the conversion of hard power into soft power. And it seems like Soft power follows hard power, but soft power is a lot stickier. It can, it can uh, last for a couple of generations. So in general, I think a major theme that I've uh, uh, revealed in my work is that openness to and engagement with foreigners is really key for developing soft power. And in the inter international system, of course, this means engagement with multilateral organizations and that engagement is essential to building and developing soft power. Thank you. Great, um, thank you, Irene. We've covered a lot of ground and, but before I invite Christina for her comments to really tie it all together, let me remind um, our uh, participants that we are taking questions. Uh, again, the email is uh, asia at wilsoncenter.org or you can tweet your questions to Asia Program. So with that, Christina. Great, well, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to engage with an exciting new book on important themes that are especially important in this current period. And yet I think also stand the test of time looking back and forward at the role of culture in how people engage in world political economy. So it's really an honor to be here. And the material is quite rich, both in the book and each of the presenters has actually added a new layer of nuance in their uh, discussion. So I'm going to give some broad overview comments and questions, but also um, look forward to how the audience engages with our uh, commentary. I want to start out, uh, since I don't have slides, just orient. I plan to talk briefly about 
culture multilateralism, what is the crisis? Is there a crisis? Then I'd like to briefly prompt the difference comparison of cultural values and partisan ideology. And then third, I'll move to a few comments on each of the presentations, which I'll have to speak fast if I wanna cover all that ground in 10 minutes. The moment we're in now makes us think that a cultural backlash, whether we call it parochial or populist is challenging multilateralism. Everything from seeing the United States president arguing that the WTO hurts US interests, withdrawing from the World Health Organization, attacking alliances to the United Kingdom withdrawal from the European Union. And this leads to the sense that multilateralism, multilateralism isn't a crisis. And certainly it is challenged in new ways. And many of these challenges take on almost a cultural perspective of the people against an elite in Geneva. But I do want to remind us as we think of this theme that actually we're still in a fairly strong place for multilateralism. So if you step back and think about the United States, at one level there is an attack on multilateralism, but it's not truly from the public at large so if we go and look at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs 2020 survey of American public opinion, we would find that a large majority, 68%, think it is best for the United States to play an active role in world affairs. And we would also see that a large majority support involvement in international organizations. 74% see trade as good for the US economy. So at a broad level, there is support for being active in the world affairs, positive views of international organizations, a majority support alliances in East Asia is beneficial to both the US and its allies, and globalization, a solid majority say that it is good for the US economy. So it's hard to say that the US public has completely withdrawn. Instead, it is a particular elite framing itself as representing the people. And I think this is where this um, volume is so important is to try and help us translate how views towards multilateralism are being framed in terms of representing particular groups, those in rural areas that are downtrodden in the economy or those who feel threatened by immigrant and ethnic diversity and to try and frame this as different subgroups rather than as a singular backlash against multilateralism. The other positive news for multilateralism is that it has not been a global retreat. The Brexit case actually shows, of course, that that was not against multilateralism. The UK was withdrawing from Europe while hoping to continue to engage in free trade. And if anything, its reliance on having a permanent seat in the United Nations and a full membership in the World Trade Organization that gives it some trading rights is more important as it withdraws from the EU. So I don't see the Brexit case as necessarily anti-multilateral. Similarly, as has been pointed out in our discussion here, we can look at East Asia as an example of the strength of multilateralism. And here really we see, you know, as Miles Kaler has said, is East Asia immune from this um, parochialism? And as uh, Kristen Hopo has so effectively said in her book and other writings, China and the emerging powers have embraced the multilateral system, trying to use it to advance their own interest. So in many ways we could say the fact that there is not a backlash against multilateralism in the advanced industrial democracies of Japan and Korea, nor is there a turn away from the rules and a direct challenge from the rising power of China, suggests there still is hope for multilateralism, whether it is a shift in leadership in the United States or a emergence to be more of a stakeholder that bears 
responsibility, um, as Kristen has urged for China to do, that would be a silver lining um, outcome. Nevertheless, I want to think about why is it that cultural values are sometimes seen as being in a challenging relationship with multilateralism. So here's my question about the volume is, it really is engaging the idea that we shouldn't just think about material interests, that people's values that are shaped by a rich context, a cultural milieu of their ideas, their social local context of jobs, identity, although carefully not bringing identity politics to the fore, but trying to look at a more um, full view of where our ideas come from. So cultural values should be applauded as bringing forth this necessary richness that our interests are not simply a function of our position in the economy. At the same time, there's a lot of overlap with partisanship and partisan ideology. And then we get to this question of, is ideology, political views, a roadmap of action different from cultural values as a roadmap for action? And where do those two intersect? Because I think they're sort of overlapping in many of the different chapters throughout the book. And that's important because again, if I were to go back to the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, looking at American public opinion, you know, I said there's overall support for a multilateral liberal order. But if you break it down on a partisan basis, you get really different views. Is it good to collaborate with other countries? 62% on average, but that's because 80% of Democrats say yes. Only 40% of Republicans say yes. That's a sharp partisan difference in the view of collaborating with other countries. The question of, should you work with international organizations? Democrats, 63% say we need more involvement with international organizations. Well, Republicans feel that there's already too much and if anything should be less work with international organizations. So I think it's really important to consider how has the view of multilateralism been seen through a prism of partisan ideology. And then if we're talking about partisan ideology, is it public opinion of the masses or is it shaped by an elite? And here, of course, Kristen Hopewell's chapter looking at the Tea Party is really important because it frames how a narrow elite captures what is the party view and then transfers that to the masses. And so if we're thinking about where the driving force is coming, if partisan ideology is the key anchor of cultural values, partisan ideology is very much shaped by a small elite group, not necessarily this bottom up what's happening in the local region. Um, so that would be a broad theoretical question. Now I'd like to shift and go a little more in detail about each of the chapters, which is really important because they're all um, quite good um, studies. So when J.P. Singh looks at cultural values, he's really bringing forward the importance of thinking about a dynamic theory of culture. I really like this idea of thinking about the role of human interactions in sequences that allows for changes in values where you have interests and ideas and culture at one time that feed into interactions that shape the culture in the next period. And so this is really quite important is to talk about culture where it's not some fixed unchanging entity. Um, and that's really quite in, an improvement in our studies. At the same time, I wonder if we were to think about where do interests frame cultural clashes? I want to have that brought out a little bit more. And especially when you think about the case we care about the most, which is the trade regime, where you could see this breakdown in the trade regime that is being driven by the North having not had reciprocity with the South, it's paternalistic. And this is a problem for how can you see the system going on? And we also see Kristen Hopewell in her book looking at this question about how emerging countries trying to take advantage of the rules 
is what's causing a breakdown. So if you take the two together, it's a little complicated because we have a system undermined by one-sided paternalism of the North and another story about the emerging countries coming into the system is what challenges the hegemony of the dominant side. So which is it? <laughs> and I would argue you can reconcile them in some ways if you think about the geoeconomics, which is, you know, how willing are you when you're thinking in an us versus them light of making concessions? And at one point, if the concessions are towards another that looks like they are poor and deserving, you're willing to let them have access without making reciprocal concessions. If your concessions are to your East Asian allies, Japan and Korea, that was tolerated. And so a long part of the East Asia economic miracle was the idea that they could get into the trade regime without having to undermine their active industrial policies. That was paternalism. It worked out really well for East Asia. The real problem we're facing now is that no one wants that kind of paternalism of one-sided concessions to China, which is not an ally and is not poor and in need. And so there's a reduction in how willing is the North to have any kind of asymmetry in the bargaining. And that is as much because of China's position, not just as a developing country, but as a geopolitical rival. And that changes the us versus them suddenly becomes rivalry on a security dimension, not just on these other issues about um, identity politics and colonial hierarchies. Um, so I think that would be interesting to hear more discussion of this issue. Miles Kaler's work is really important to sort of ground the view that the effect of globalization shouldn't be seen in the aggregate. So I can throw out these aggregate surveys that US still supports free trade, but what really matters is regional variation. And economists have been starting and looking at different economic effects and we political scientists need to think about how they shape views of politics, but also through the cultural frame that people's ideas of what are their values are shaped by their neighborhood and that this cosmopolitan values of those in a rich city connected to the globe sees multilateralism as positive while rural areas do not. And I really agree with Miles that this is an important frame and I, his presentation is right on to say that where there's an East Asia immunity, it may be because they did a better job to help the down and out rural areas have slower liberalization, more compensation through pork barrel policy and less immigration. So there wasn't that particular dimension of rapid increase in diversity to threaten local polit political culture. So I think I generally agree with him on this perspective. And the only question I have for Miles Kaler in terms of thinking about this urban, rural, down and out parochial views that shape cultural backlash, could you also play up what is the cultural view of the manufacturing sector? And why is the down and out manufacturing sector put on a special pedestal of importance? And I, I would just like to know how this has come into the debate. Is that you know, similar to what we've seen in the past towards farmers, where as farmers decline, they get more and more protection, not just because they're declining, but because they're raised up as part of the national identity in a sympathetic group. And is that part of this narrative? So we shouldn't think of parochials as just being local, but they have managed to frame their difficulties as of national importance. I mean, manufacturing in the United States is less than 11% of GDP. So what's the big focus? Um, it must be raising their significance. I need to be a little quicker because I do want to get to the questions. Turning to Kristen's fascinating study, I mean, both her study and her presentation, looking at American exceptionalism through how did the United States take a classic instrument of industrial policy where you have this export import bank that gives money to help support US exports, common practice and 
very tried and true in East Asia, where China and Korea are shown to have among the most active use of exports, import financing. Um, and Kristen highlights how the attack on the export import bank by the Tea Party was framed as almost a cultural aversion to this idea of corporate welfare. And I think that's really important is that it was not just about the economic bottom line of the cost to the budget, but rather what type of policy. But this gets to the idea of is cultural values about what's the appropriate balance between state and economy. And this has long been part of our debate about what's different between East Asia economic development and the liberal market economy of the US and UK. So are we actually turning back to these old divisions about what is the appropriate role of government in the economy? What I found most interesting in the study about the challenge to the Export Import Bank is that on the one side, there's this attack that there shouldn't be corporate welfare. That the US is not about giving money to companies to support their exports, companies win. And yet there's a surprising reluctance to follow reciprocity, which is of course one of the typical tropes that the Trump regime has put forward as a priority is to have reciprocity. And yet the Tea Party arguments against Exim Bank were like, unilateral disarmament. The US should just stop these subsidies. It was not one of get a tough deal that we will negotiate everyone to end the subsidies. And so I think you could explore a little further about whether the disagreement with multilateralism as a strategy also lies behind this unilateral disarmament approach instead of let's go to the OECD and then negotiate another round of what is a proper transparent restraint on export financing that everyone agrees to for mutual restraint. This, the road not taken may have also been part of a political values track against the interests of the United States. Finally, you know, Irene is just completely right. Irene Wu brings up the idea of soft power importance and thinking about how Fundamentally, we can look at cultural preferences by where we send our visitors and our students. And I think this is really a brilliant idea for trying to map um, variations in ties between countries, outward looking and orientation of countries, and showing that actually there's still some cosmopolitan engagement. Um, I think it would be useful to also look at the effect of these exchanges. And so she's really highlighting where do you send people, we presume maybe that engages them in a more positive cosmopolitan view. If you were to connect this to Miles Kaler volume about the idea that the cities are connected to the world. Well, what about these people who go and study abroad or those who receive them? You know, is the long time lingering effect a two way um, opening or are these, um, channels ever inducing fears. And you know it might be helpful to try and differentiate, but the people flows as students and tourists have a positive effect on attitudes towards open globalization. In contrast, how, why is it that immigration has a different one, the job threat or the presence? But even at the students level, we do need to think about it carefully and who are the students, what is their exchange? Um, Naima Green Riley is a PhD student at Harvard who has a fascinating study on the Confucius Institutes that shows the students in Confucius Institutes learning Chinese language in the US don't just come out loving China. They know more, but are often, if anything, more negative. And so we want to think about how does the exposure of students going abroad or those meeting the students shape their own views of each other and the world? And this brings me back in closing to this question of ideological differences and values differences. Because again, that Chicago study of American public opinion showed that 65% of Republicans favor limiting Chinese students coming to the United States, while only 32% of Democrats favor limiting Chinese students. So even something as fundamental as whether you think having students come visit is good or bad, falls on party lines. And is that being shaped by elite messaging or is it shaped by where the people live and their community and that 
cultural view? That's a question I would have for us all. Thank you so much um, for that very insightful analysis. Um, would any of our authors like to respond to Christina's comments or can I turn to questions? No, okay. Let me lump a couple of questions together um, in the interest of time. Um, the first one is about uh, multilateral uh, support for multilateralism. Um, yes, there is continued support for multilateralism, but there is a di diminishing appetite for a US-led order. Um, how and whether values will change as there is a weaker role for the United States and the multilateral system. And then the second question is about uh, the government role in the economy. And uh, I believe it was Miles who talked about place-based policies uh, to address uh, the needs of those left behind. Are there good examples? Um, are there countries that have been more successful in addressing the needs of those left behind? Um, or are there, is this more of a hypothetical um, rather than an example of good practice? Did you want me to respond to that? Um, and, and anyone, you can all jump in, uh, but Miles. Thank sure. You. Well, I'm sure others will want to comment on the first point about the appetite of the United States. I think Christina Davis was absolutely right. Um, the American public still favors, by all accounts, at least in survey analysis, for uh, an engaged role for the United States. I think a great deal of skepticism on all quarters for opposed to military in intervention after our experience with the Iraq war in Afghanistan. But I think, yes, there's support broadly in the American public for engagement. But the same surveys that Christina cited will also demonstrate that the US public wants to share leadership. And there's a big interest in burden sharing, right? And so I think here, once again, Donald Trump picked up on a theme that many people found very, um, he, he did it in a way many people wouldn't agree with, but the idea of pushing our allies to do more, um, to to do more, especially in terms of military spending, was you know that sort of burden sharing is very evocative for the American public. Um, on the question about place-based policies, no, I don't think so. I mean, the European research I've been um, delving into suggests that they are grappling with this issue as well. And as I mentioned, most of our place-based policies in the past, we had we have been working on Appalachia in the United States for a very long time, and Appalachia is still one of the poorest regions in the United States, dependent on on, on in industries that are in decline, like coal. Um, and uh, we need to think of new ways of thinking about policies that will be directed at communities and often communities where the likely leaders who could lead economic revitalization have left <laughs> to go to uh, greener pastures in the urban hubs that I described as the global cities. So it's a, it's a big, big problem. And it, once again, place space means looking at whole communities holistically and not necessarily looking at how we can help out individuals. We must do that as well, obviously. And, and things like uh, better work, worker retraining, there are a whole host of policies we've already thought through at the individual level, but community-based policies, I think we've been much less successful at. And that is, it seems to me, the community environments, the sense of economic decline on all, all types of dimensions is what we need to try to counteract. The Brookings Institution, I wanna give them a plug, has been doing a, a great deal of interesting work on this, this question of, of place-based policies. And so I think people are thinking about this, whether it's politically feasible given our political system in the US, that's yet another question. Thanks very much. Um, I did want to respond to Christina's uh, 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 remarks. Thank you so much for reading the material so thoroughly and giving us some uh, really pertinent comments. But, um, you know, in terms of your question, you know, when people have these social interactions that I document in, in the data, what effect does that have on their perspective? I was reminded when I was looking at your new book, Landscapes of Law, Practicing Sovereignty in Transnational Terrain, I thought one of the po main points of your introduction is that, you know, this idea of national um, takes place in a context of global and one is one is a has a relationship with the other and i think that's 
certainly true when I look at the education on international higher education, that the, um, the, the field work qualitative studies that look at what the effect of young people going abroad is that they have a clear idea of what their own national um, culture is. And without that experience abroad, they really have no firm sense of what is national and what is global. And they begin to develop that definition. It's part of like a, 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 a phase of maturity in, in, in developing a view of the world. So I just wanted to bring that up. Now, in terms of the, um, the, uh, the simple view of what these, the counting this number of social interactions is, you know, an economist would say in terms of supply and demand, if people keep going, they must be having a good experience. And if they didn't like it, they would stop going and that would show up in the data. So that's another more uh, 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 flippant way to think of it as well. Thanks. Um, you're on mute, Shihoko. <laughs> Okay, we are still accepting questions. Uh, again, the email is asia at wilsoncenter.org. Twitter um, is at Asia Program. Uh, JP, I think you were raising your hand. Yeah, I wanted to address this uh, question of uh, ideology and partisanship. And one of the things that I'm suggesting in, in, in my chapter, mostly borrowing from people like Anne Swidler, is that. Uh, <clears throat> You know, a worldview, which is made up of various types of cultural values, um, it, at some point cannot help people uh, specify a plan for action in an apartheidized terms. And as that worldview begins to fall apart and there's cultural ideology, people will turn to, uh, I'm sorry, as, as that worldview falls apart, people often turn to, in Swidler's analysis, to simplifying ideologies. You know? And one can see there how political entrepreneurship would play a role in furthering those simplifying ideologies, being able to say us versus them. Um, but one of the things that I think this uh, panel has been emphasizing is that while that worldview definitely exists and is inhabited by certain political entrepreneurs and certain planners, it's not widely shared, uh, not in the US and elsewhere. The second point I want to make, and that's about the developing world and and, and this idea of, you know, of claiming privileges in the trading system, again, I think the cultural stickiness and the historical experience is very important. The developing world did not want special and differential treatment. Uh, it was something that was invented uh, to sort of, it was this sort of this side payment in some ways because the developing world couldn't be given uh, 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 reciprocal access in some ways uh, for, for agricultural commodities. Even UNCTAD was created as a way to put pressure in the old trading system through the general agreements and tariffs and trade. So what we have now is a monster that we've created and that's the cultural contradiction in some ways. Now we have in China claiming this developing world status, but in the 60s, it was created as a side payment. So it becomes very hard, but I, I would definitely say, as we think about a more inclusive uh, trading system from the perspective of the US, the developing world may have to let go of these SDTs, SDTs only because, not just because of China, but because they also produce a lot of inefficiencies uh, in, in the way that your local agriculture and industry, and we're beginning to see that at the level of the WTO. Agricultural producers who do not want SDTs or the special and differential treatment versus those who do, and similarly for industry. Uh, so yes, we would need sort of this reform on both sides, but let's not forget that there's a cultural stickiness to this. If it's all right, maybe I'll just pick up on uh, some of these comments as well. I, I, I wanted to pick up on JP's comment about special and differential treatment, and this was uh, also related to some of the comments Christine was making in her excellent discussant comments earlier. And this question of whether China is entitled to special and differential treatment or not, I think has become probably the most contentious issue in the trading system. Uh, so it's worth getting into a little bit more. Um, you know, Christine in her comments said, China is, is not poor and no longer in need. And so it doesn't fall into the category of developing countries that should be entitled to, to special and differential treatment. I, I think that's a widely held view, but I, I think we need to problematize that a bit. Um, you know, Certainly granting China special and differential treatment in certain areas and certain sectors is hugely problematic and fishery subsidies is a key example of that where Granting special and differential treatment to the world's largest industrial industrial fishing country totally, um, you know, it, it makes any 
disciplines you're attempting to create totally unworkable. Um, but the reality is China is still a poor country. I mean, it's uh, per capita incomes of 10,000 US dollars a year compared to the US has per capita incomes of $64,000 a year. I mean, there's a huge gulf here, right? So it's natural that China still wants to engage in uh, policies to try to foster its economic development. It, think special and differential treatment and space to conduct industrial policy will help it to do that. Um, and that is, you know, a legitimate objective. It still has a long way to go before it's anywhere near catching up with uh, per capita income levels of the, the rich developed countries. Um, so I think we need to, this is such a thorny and difficult issue, but ultimately, um, you know, if the multilateral trading system is to continue to be able to negotiate new international trade rules, somehow finding a way to develop a more complicated approach to dealing with SDT with these big emerging economies is going to be critical. Yes, but it wasn't the fact that China is poor, which I agree, but rather the part that it's a rival that really complicates its engagement. Um, question from Miles. You refer to defensive ethno-nationalism. Is there such a thing as non-defensive ethno-nationalism? And that's from an anonymous uh, questioner. Oh, I think so, yes. Uh, that's why I like the term parochial, because people can be quite uh, defensive about their identity, their national identity, and what's happening to their local cultures in those terms without wanting to export it to other, uh, other places. Uh, think about Donald Trump once again, and once again, in per, very his personal beliefs, if you will, and ideology. He's very, very non-interventionist. He is very opposed to liberal universalism. You know, he doesn't want us to go abroad, expanding, uh, sending our. Uh, he probably doesn't believe we can export our beliefs and values abroad. Um, but those who support him, many of them, certainly feel very fiercely defensive about those same values or their identity, nationalist identity as Americans, and the same would go for some of the European movements. Um, so, I mean, nationalist movements do have this problem. They're not easily exported. <laughs> and it is only liberal, liberal nationalisms that have had this kind of exporting zeal along with communist internationalist nationalisms when they were in existence. I don't sense that in the case of China. And it's very interesting that you don't find, I think you see a lot of, um, you do see some defensive ethnonationalism, but one of the big questions about China, and it'd be interesting to hear what Christine and others think about this, is, is China going to export its model? Um, and, and those who think really it's a kind of a liberal internationalist thing to be exporting uh, our values abroad, China's not in that category. It, there's no longer a communist international, so China is basically defensive in its in its nationalism. But there are those also who argue that making the world safe for authoritarianism, as Jessica Chen Weiss has described it, does involve some export of something from China in the terms of values and ideology. Um, so that's what I meant by defensive, um, not exporting our values, protecting us against the outside. Um, and I think that's where immigration becomes such a sensitive issue, because that's the rest of the world really, you know, face to face with us. Um, on a daily basis. And that's why it's become such a hot political issue in Europe, the United States, and other societies as well. I mentioned Singapore, even in Singapore. If I can jump in just briefly, Miles, I totally agree that there isn't a way to export nationalism. But what's interesting is how countries engage with international law by reserving the right to cultural rights and their national room for sovereignty. And so, the debate between sovereignty and international law is longstanding. And that is exactly what you're saying. The defense of your nationalism is to assert sovereignty as you engage multilateral rules. And, you know, China has been at the front lines of defense of sovereignty. And so I think that is a key frame. And whether they on the economic side may recommend a few policies, but they have generally are also defensive rather than trying to break down other countries' models. All right. Uh, we actually do have a few more questions, but I am afraid that all good things must come to an end. And we are at close to the end of our hour. Um, so I want to thank you all for this incredibly um, interesting and very timely discussion today. I also want to congratulate the contributors to the book, uh, Cultural Values in Political Economy, 
on a, a great read. Um, the, uh, the link uh, with a discount code uh, to the publication is available on our website. And on the website, you can also see a video recording of this discussion as well. So with that, um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to our speakers uh, for your time. And hopefully, we'll see you again soon. Bye bye. Thank you very much uh, to the Wilson Center, Shehoko. Thank you. And the panelists. Thank you. Thanks a lot.